Great. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Victor. I'm the head of uh, communications and knowledge management at the at ILRI at the International Livestock Research Institute. I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, the ILRI Venture 37 webinar series on livestock and livelihoods. This is the first webinar is on leveraging livestock to combat malnutrition perspectives from East Africa. And the purpose is to discuss the important role that the livestock sector can play in bringing solutions that enhance human nutrition and food security across Africa. And we'll be focusing on the collaborative work that we've been doing uh, between ILRI and Venture 37. Uh, before, before we start, just to give you some tech tips, uh, remember to, we won't, we won't be using for attendees, we'll not be using so much the uh, microphone or be talking, so not too much to worry about that with that, but please do put on your headset, it's always easier uh, to hear. Uh, remember to put your full name into the uh, box and you can do that by clicking on your name and renaming yourself. So if you click on more, you can see rename and you can rename yourself and put in your name and your organization, just so we see where you're from. Uh, we are going to start the closed captioning uh, and uh, we'll see how that works, but it's just to help people kind of see what people are saying. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work so much, but we will be uh, using that. Uh, again, keep your microphone off on the webinar. It shouldn't be too much of an issue, but just make sure your, uh, your microphone is off. Uh, if you can't see or hear anything, do close and restart the Zoom uh, and other programs. So that usually helps. Uh, and again, one of the things that we'd really like to initiate is make sure that we're having a conversation throughout this uh, webinar. So please use the chat to post comments or questions during the presentations, and we'll really hopefully have a conversation as we, we go through this. Uh, and finally, just to let everyone know that the video, is, the session is being recorded. We have audio and video chat, and even any private chants are often uh, visible to the organizers once it's downloaded. So just to be aware of that. Uh, so with that, today we have an exciting lineup of speakers, and I'd like to, to kick us off, I would like to hand over to John uh, Ellenberger, who is the Executive Director of Land of Lakes uh, from Venture and Venture 37, which was founded in 1981 by Land of Lakes, to kind of take us through the introduction. Over to you, John. Good afternoon, uh, Michael, and thank you uh, for the introduction and also for kicking us off here today. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here today to present the webinar series on behalf of ILRI and Land O'Lakes Venture 37. Over 600 million smallholder farmers trust their livelihoods to animals worldwide. By 2050, the demand for animal source foods will triple based on the needs of our growing and diversifying global population. The Livestock and Livelihoods webinar series <clears throat> will highlight the realities and the importance of livestock in global development and how organizations like ILRI and Venture 37, among many others, are working together to bring solutions through livestock that are critical to global priorities, including climate change, food security, human nutrition, one Health, and empowering marginalized communities. Exploring this connection between the livestock systems and livelihoods is a priority uh, for both ILRI, of course, and also for Venture 37, which is why we have joined forces to uh, co-produce this webinar series. We, Venture 37, are a 501c3 nonprofit that, as Michael mentioned, is affiliated with Land O'Lakes Inc., which is a US-based $15 billion farmer-owned uh, cooperative with diversified agribusinesses in the areas of dairy and livestock and animal er, and, uh, and crops. We bring over 40 years of agricultural development experience in over 80 countries to our work and to our partnerships. And all of this is done in pursuit of helping global communities thrive through agriculture. Currently, we're partnering with ILRI on several projects to help improve livelihoods through livestock. Those, pro those programs include the Gates Foundation funded 
public-private partnerships for artificial insemination delivery project, which works to build the growth of the private sector in Tanzania and in Ethiopia through improved AI services and private sector investments. Another is the Africa Dairy Genetic Gains Project, which supported a farmer-focused partnership that recorded on-farm performance and genetic information on dairy cattle, again in Tanzania and Ethiopia, and provides feedback on the data-driven insights gained back to farmers through educational messaging. Lastly, the Kenya Nourishing Prosperity Alliance, which aims to advance the sustainable farming practices of more than 5,000, <clears throat> excuse me, 5,000 uh, women smallholder farmers while increasing the supply of nutritional dairy products to local communities. Across our work together, ILRI continues to be a valued partner that brings the voices of smallholder farmers to the forefront of their innovations and technologies while seeking to use research to reduce poverty in developing countries for efficient, safe, and sustainable use of livestock. We also share a common mission to ensure better lives through livestock, so we truly could not think of a better partner for hosting this Livestock and Livelihoods series. The goal of this webinar series is to highlight how livestock can enrich lives and unlock potential. It will feature experts, many of whom you'll hear from today, in the areas of livestock and of international development, pairing cutting edge research with last mile implementation experience in East Africa. And our discussions will dive deeply into topics that that impact livestock systems and how humans can both benefit from and interact with livestock. Today's discussion will explore the intersection of livestock and food security, specifically how the livestock sector can bring solutions that enhance human nutrition and food security across East Africa. Our work has proven that livestock plays a crucial role in improving the economies and the families and smallholder farming around the world. Our speakers and panelists will discuss the differences we are seeing in projects when animal source foods are accessible to low income communities and are a part of people's diets, especially those of children. Today's presentations will also highlight how animal source foods can provide needed nutrition to prevent issues such as malnutrition and stunting. This is bound to be an enlightening start to our series and an enlightening discussion this morning or today. So with that, I would like to thank everyone for being here and I look forward to the presentation. Michael, back to you. Excellent, thanks a lot, John. That was, that was really good. It gives us a good setup for the day and welcomes everybody here. So uh, after this, we're going to, we're going to now have a, just a quick video to really get us in the mood and really kind of take us to the field, take us to Rwanda to really look at uh, nutrition and livestock from a, from a real perspective. So we have a short video that we would like to play uh, and then we'll move into the speaking part of the session. Uh, so please, uh, could we start that off now? Um, can, can you stop screen sharing, please? Oh, okay. It, the screen is being shared. No, um, please, please take it down. Oh, okay. There you go.
Excellent. That that was really just to kick us off, and you know, uh, we will be actually uh, hearing more about this project uh, from Emily uh, when she speaks in a little while. Uh, just to kind of get a sense of what people thought about that, we do have a question. What is similar or different from your own context of work? So please put that into the chat and we'll kind of continue to look at that. But it'd be interesting to hear from others on the chat as to how you felt that this links to your own uh, context. Uh, so with that, I'd uh, like to uh, start the, the kind of uh, presentation part of the session and then we'll be going into a more discussion part, but we have a couple of presentations. And our introductory presentation is by uh, Dr. Uh, Laura, Le uh, Laura Inati, uh, and she'll be talking about building the narrative, the livestock derived foods and of uh, sustainable and healthy diets. Uh, Dr. Laura is an associate professor in public health at Washington State University in St. Louis. She's also director of the E3 Nutrition Lab. Uh, working to uh, identify environmentally sustainable and evolutionary appropriate and economically affordable nutrition solutions around the world. Uh, she's a visiting scholar at ILRI, uh, and she leads projects all over the world, really, in Haiti, uh, Haiti Ecuador, and Kenya. Uh, and she's really working on transdisciplinary approaches using animal source foods and small livestock and fisheries. And she just started, she just produced a report with the UN on livestock derived foods, which will be kind of the central part of this presentation today. So over to you, Laura, and thank you very much for participating in this. Hi, um, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you great. Wonderful. Um, so the title of my presentation is Building the Narrative, Livestock and Sustainable Healthy Diets. And um, I wanna say thank you to um, uh, the, the conveners of this webinar for um, allowing me to um, give this presentation and be on this panel with such esteemed um, speakers. Next slide, please. When we're given such a short amount of time, we have to start with our last slide. Um, so these are the key messages that um, I'm going to communicate in this presentation. Stunting affects 144 million young ch children around the world. That's one in five with pretty serious consequences for growth and brain development. Livestock derived foods can play a critical role in alleviating stunting and malnutrition, but there are large disparities around the world, as you will see in a minute. LDFs provide limiting nutrients in highly bioavailable matrices and thus are powerful in both abundance and in scarcity. Epidemiological evidence supports the need um, to ensure access to LDFs. You'll be hearing about access um, in a later presentation, um, but this is, this is particularly true in certain periods of the life course, childhood, pregnancy and lactation, and old age. Finally, action is needed to rebalance food systems and support sustainable mixed livestock production to safeguard human, animal, and planetary health. Next slide. Next slide. So there are large consumption disparities around the world. And what we can see from this figure that over the last five decades, we have seen increasing consumption on average globally. But again, this varies by region. Um, in Europe, there's particularly high consumption of milk, but across all LDFs, Southeast Asia has actually seen the greatest increase in consumption of LDFs while Africa the topic of today's webinar has largely plateaued and even declined for some livestock derived products. Next slide, please. LDFs are nutrient dense and bioavailable, particularly for limiting nutrients that we see that are deficient in certain populations. So as indicated by the, dispensable and dis the digestible and dispensable amino acid score, you can see eggs and milk exceed 100% as compared to plant-based foods at much lower percentages. LDFs provide essential fatty acids in the appropriate ratios for human metabolism, as well as um, a mix of vitamins and minerals that are essential for growth and development. But we can't forget the bioactive factors um, that we are still in the midst of building evidence for and in discovery that are provided again, only in animal source foods. Next slide. 
The packaging of LDFs is what is particularly important. Um, I like to use vitamin A as an example. So in LDF matrix, we have um, vitamin A provided as retinol, which is, which is absorbed at 12 to 24 times the rate compared to plant-based carotenoids or beta carotene. This is especially important for a young child that has a small gastric capacity and can't, needs to have efficient absorption. Next slide, please. There's epidemiological evidence that undergirds and supports differences in the life course uh, phase for the need for LDFs. So among infants and young children, systematic reviews have shown that animal source foods can increase linear growth as marked by hyperage Z score and reduce stunting. In school age children, we have experimental trials showing LDFs improve cognitive function as well as growth. But on the other end of the spectrum, there's also increased risk of overweight and obesity. In pregnancy and lactation, systematic reviews have shown that supplementation with animal source foods can increase birth weight. In adults, again, there is some negative evidence to show processed meats may be linked to colorectal cancers, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. Um, among the elderly, actually, there's, there's not sufficient evidence, especially from low resource countries. But systematic reviews have shown that animal source foods can preserve muscle mass, um, improve uh, recovery after ho hospitalization, and fat-free mass. We need to build the evidence base in the elderly, elderly, that's clear. Next slide. Our lab has done research to show um, the importance of animal source foods. I have two, two trials highlighted here. Um, in Ecuador, the Laloon trial uh, was a randomized controlled trial to test one egg per day for six months in the complementary feeding period. And in fact, we increased linear growth by 0.63 LAZ and reduced stunting by 47%. But supporting these findings was the increase in biomarkers of brain development for choline and DHA at as well high effect sizes. In East Africa, among the pa pastoralists in San Bruno, we've shown that livestock ownership increased nutrient adequacy for vitamins A, B12, and zinc. Milk consumption increased BMI scores in the youth and adolescents. Cattle and chicken ownership increased dietary diversity. Next slide. So in conclusion, taking action. Next slide. As Michael mentioned, we have recently launched the UN Nutrition Paper. This is a consensus document across several UN agencies um, led by UN Nutrition to talk about and build the narrative of livestock-derived foods in sustainable, healthy diets. Its conclusions align with the key messages that I have communicated today. We need to rebalance food systems and ensure equitable LDF consumption and support sustainable mixed production systems to protect animal and planetary health. Next slide. The paper talks about taking action after synthesizing the evidence base. So once again, we need to create an enabling environment with equitable food systems generate the policies and programs that ensure access in critical stages of the life course. Social and behavioral change programs and food-based dietary guidelines are, are essential. To protect planetary health, we can mitigate the environmental impacts of LDF production through mixed farming systems, adaptation to local environments and sustainable animal products, and aspire to the one health principles with, small, with support to small-scale productions, women farmers, and efficiencies in feed conversion rates and local breeds. Research is needed to, can, on an ongoing basis to build the evidence base for LDFs, again, in certain life phases. And to look at the bidirectionality of climate change and LDFs. And finally, we see growing institutional commitments um, to this topic as, um, as exampled by UN Nutrition, ILRI, UN, towards the UN Decade on Nutrition. Next slide. So in sum, LDFs can play an important role in meeting global nutrition targets, particularly for stunting, anemia, and low birth weight, but for also for achieving SDGs 2, 
12, and 13. Next slide. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Laura. That was really good. I think it really framed uh, the discussions and the presentations that we'll have in the rapid fire uh, session that we're just about to have. And I think what what we really see is, is that, you know, it, it is really about healthy, equitable outcomes that we're looking for, for everybody that's healthy for the planet as well as for people. And I think in the, the presentations that we'll hear in this rapid fire session, uh, this will really show you what's happening in East Africa and how uh, livestock derived foods can really play that kind of role in developing a, a healthy outcomes for people in the planet. Uh, so with that, I'd like to start that off. Uh, we have uh, four talks that we're going to be giving right now, and we're going to ask the presenters to really try to boil down their work into five minutes, uh, which is, you know, so everyone gets a chance. And then after that, we'll have about a 20, 25 minute discussion, 15 minute discussion. So I'd like to kick it off and have, uh, we have uh, the first presentation is on increasing access to animal source foods in Tanzania. And uh, Joaquim Balakana will be presenting. He is the national coordinator for the Paid Tanzania program, the public private partnership for artificial dissemination delivery program paid. He brings more than 20 years of experience in the Tanzanian dairy sector. Uh, uh, particularly in program development and implementation and capacity strengthening of the value, uh, dairy value chains and in dairy genetics. So over to you, Joaquim. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Michael. And uh, um, I would like to take you through quickly because of the short time, I'll be very, very fast. Actually, in this presentation, I'm going to highlight uh, that uh, school milk is one of the options to address uh, human nutrition, particularly among the young children, but also to increase uh, human access to uh, animal source foods. Next slide, next slide please. Yes. Uh, Principally, Tanzanians are really facing with human nutrition challenges, and it's more rampant, as you can see there, in uh, the central and the western part of Tanzania. And out of uh, 31, I mean, 31 regions that we have in the country, almost 50% have been heavily affected by stunted growth of children. On average, uh, 14 regions have almost uh, 100,000 children with stunted growth. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, Dairy Nourish Africa is a pilot project that is implemented in East Africa, but it has started in Tanzania. And actually, uh, we are working around addressing human nutrition as one of the uh, challenges that is being addressed by DNA. And um, we are working together with the uh, processors to ensure that we address those challenges facing processors by themselves. First, uh, under the processor, we look as a processor as a really a linchpin or a pivot for improving access to uh, nutri nutrition through improving, uh, uh, driving the enterprise to full potential, increasing processing. And they also we also work with the processor to ensure that they work closely with the farmers and a farmer ally uh, uh, arrangement uh, of access to uh, extension services where processor also support farmers to ensure that they access input and they access extension services to increase production on the upstream. But at the same time, uh, DNA were working very much with the processor to ensure that we give them high, high touch support for them to improve uh, 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 distribution. At the same time, we are working with the process and the government to really target uh, the promotion activities, which uh, aims at growing uh, consumer, uh, dairy consumer, and particularly we target schools uh, to promote school milk pro promotion as so as as part of making sure that uh, these school children are having good nutrition and they uh, improve starting started. Next, next, next slide, please. Yeah, with the, uh, the school milk promotion, we work very high 
uh, we work uh, in, 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 in collaboration with the, uh, the processor to uh, develop a high impact school meal promotion. And in this case, we have targeted uh, uh, three, three processors, but we target also to reach out are about uh, 4,000 uh, children, I mean, uh, children at, in the schools. And uh, before we, we could start the promotion campaign, high impact promotion campaign, we did a, a, a study to assess their consumption demand in the country. And the, based on the result of this uh, study, we came to realize that there was a need for consumer, uh, for consumer awareness campaign. But also the study uh, showed that there is a, uh, uh, using the school meal consumption is one way really to, uh, to change behavioral changes of the social, of the society. So we have been uh, to make sure that we, we work on the sustainable way. We've been engaging with the public and private. So we are working with the government processor and the other stakeholders really implement the school meal promotion, uh, which is more sustainable. Uh, because previously the school meal promotion were not uh, sustainable because of lack of funding, but we are using a different approach where uh, the parents, uh, the ones who are funding the, the, the school meal promotion for sustainability purposes. So in a, in, in a nutshell, we are working with three processors and we have identified the uh, schools in, a, in, in the district to try the innovation, innovative model which aligned very well with the government of Tanzania to ensure that this uh, uh, this 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 uh, this time the, pro the the promotion activities and the promotion activities is going to be more sustainable. Let's let's try it, please. Yeah, um, one of the as, as, as one of way to promote school milk promotion is uh, to ensure that uh, the process also increase demand. And you can see on, on the picture there, on the left side is one of the events which was conducted in one of the region. And the, the person you see in the picture is, um, is, a, is a regional commissioner who is distributing milk to school people in one of the events. So we are working closely with the processors to uh, test these uh, uh, options to uh, make sure that uh, the high level and the good a, a, a good, good way of uh, distributing milk is being tested. And the, this uh, model is going to be tested with the processor and ensure that uh, the processor are iterate and they are going to uh, iterate and they are going to repeat the, 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 the approach. Uh, under DNA, we really support uh, processors by equipment and also we design the student nutrition educational uh, programming I mean, campaigns. And also we develop awareness campaigns to change behavior. In total, as I said before, we engage with the 20 schools and we expect to reach around one, I mean, 4,000 uh, students and the over 5,000 other community members. But the, uh, one thing which is more important with this, under this pilot school week pro program, we will be measuring and monitoring uh, the preference and the uh, based on the uh, monitoring data, we'll be able to uh, inform and to give a feedback processors on how to develop a good challenge, I mean, a good, a good strategy to increase milk production, I mean, milk, milk consumption in the, in, in the country. Um, in conclusion, I would like to say uh, school milk formation has been proven to be one way of improving uh, and inculcating a catch of drinking, drinking milk in the future generation, which also contributes to increase access to uh, 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 animal source and also improve human nutrition in the future generation. Thank you very much. Excellent, thank you so much, Joaquin. And as you see, Joaquin, there's a couple of questions in, your, uh, in the chat, so maybe you can just answer those in the chat. Uh, thank you for keeping to time. So with that, I'm gonna move us over quickly to the next presentation. Uh, which we have, uh, we're moving from Tanzania up to Ethiopia, and we have, uh, which the next presentation will be on ensuring growth through nutrition in Ethiopia. And this is done by uh, Getnet uh, Asafa, who is a senior technical services support livestock specialist with Venture 737. He's a lead researcher on feed resources and animal nutrition at the Ethiopian Institute of Agriculture Research 
and holds a PhD in animal nutrition and free feed resource production and management. Uh, he's uh, served as the livestock research director at uh, EIAR uh, uh, and has received numerous awards, including the lead researcher award in livestock uh, in 2017. So over to you, Dr. Getnet. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, I'm going to give you a quick overview of the Grows Through Nutrition Project. The Grows Through Nutrition Project is a US aid and venture search seven funded multi-sectoral project, which is implemented by a consortium of different organizations. And it was hosted actually by Save the Children International. It is implemented in the four major regions in Ethiopia which is actually Oromia, Amahara, Tigray, and Southern regions in a total of uh, 100 districts. Next, please. The background of the Growth Nutrition Project is the huge problem the country facing on food and nutrition security. Uh, as you see it, uh, values for the different indicators of malnutrition uh, in children and women which is actually very high. And uh, for example, like stunting in children is about 38%, which is actually very, very big. On the other hand, if you see the production system, which is not actually uh, nutrition sensitive, and it mainly focuses on, on production of stable crops like cereals, maize, and wheat. Next, please. So the uh, main objective of uh, the livelihood component of the grocery nutrition project is uh, to increase access to diverse, safe, quality and uh, uh, quality foods and has four major intervention pillars. Uh, these are actually, the first one is to promote sustainable ap approach to produce, uh, including uh, production of livestock, vegetables, uh, fruits and of course high quality foods like pulses. And the second intervention is promote post-harvest handling technology, especially for perishable products like uh, vegetables and some annual products. Uh, the third pillar is increasing women participation in income generating activities uh, to, to empower women because if she has income, then actually she improves uh, of course the family nutrition. The fourth uh, uh, the intervention pillar is to strengthen uh, the government extension workers, especially, and the private input suppliers. This is actually to ensure uh, the project sustainability after when it's phased out. Next, please. Uh, there are actually a lot of achievements in this project, but I would like only to emphasize only a few of them. Uh, the first one is in the Growth to nutrition project intervention approach, uh, use of animal source food as part of the diversified diet with our approach, and uh, through promotion of nutrition sensitive agriculture like poultry, sheep, and goats, which are actually very responsive, productive, and environmentally very good because these are small animals, which actually the emission is also uh, very small. And of course, we, we, we address also some dairy processing technologies and the like. And uh, the measure of success for this intervention was based on the pre and post harvest assess post uh, assessment showed that there was a reduction in most vulnerable households hunger from 48% to 11%. Actually, this is a remarkably high achievement. And the second, the second uh, project intervention approach was we focused on improved access to nutritious foods, like animal products, vegetables, fruits, and pulses. And on based on our assessment, the success, the measure of success for this intervention was women receiving diets increased from 2% to 16%. Of course, this achievement doesn't mean it's, it's adequate, but still it's very low. And then we have to, we have to work more to improve the, the diets of women. Uh, the other uh, project intervention approach was we focus on local solutions to make you know, the project very sustainable. We do actually different interventions, like for example, to produce 
uh, and supply fertile hatch hatching eggs for improved uh, chicken breeds like Coco, which was actually our, our uh, chicken breed we were intervening. And uh, post harvest storage practices, which are actually simple, cheaper, which can be made locally. Uh, organizing women and poor households in saving groups, and of course, encourage uh, households to build assets. Uh, based on this uh, intervention, we found that children who consume diverse foods, which is actually four out of seven food groups, increased from 12% in the bed year to 34% in 2020. So generally, the project was very successful in which most vulnerable Households, small farmers, and other like input suppliers have improved their livelihood and benefited. It was found that the impact of livestock related interventions in improving nutrition and income generation was very significant. Most vulnerable households and model farmers also understand the importance of improved technologies and skills. One of our model farmers said chicken production is a science to be successful. We will teach the farmers before selling eggs and follow up after. This is briefly what I have. Thank you very much, Michael. Back to you. Excellent, Getna, and right on time. Really, really good. That's excellent. Again, uh, please ask uh, Getnet any uh, questions in the chat, and he'll be answering them there. Uh, we didn't see uh, Getnet's or Joachim's face, but so in the, the next presentations, please remember Emma, uh, Emily, and uh, and. Tedese to turn on your camera as well. So we're going to again move to the next presentation, which it looks back at the video that we saw and some of the some of the things that were going on in that video. It's uh, titled "Impact of Animal Source Food: uh, Social Behavior Change, Communication Interventions Among the Garinka Beneficiaries in Rwanda." And this will be presented by Emily Uma, who is an agriculture economist based in Uganda and working at the at ILRI. Uh, who works across multidisciplinary team of scientists to design interventions to improve livelihoods, incomes, and assets of smallholders, uh, particularly in the pig value chain uh, in Uganda. She's leading uh, a USAID-funded Feed the Future uh, Innovation Lab for Livestock Systems uh, in Rwanda, which focuses on enhancing the quality and consumption of milk through behavior change uh, nutrition communication. She has a lot of great experience working with crop livestock farmers in Rwanda, Burundi, and uh, uh, Eastern DRC. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Emily. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michael. Um, so I'm going to share lessons from uh, a livestock systems innovation lab project uh, in Rwanda that focuses on Girinka program, which is a livestock asset transfer program as well as a social behavior change communication intervention around animal source foods uh, consumption. So Girinka pro, uh, pro, uh, program is, uh, it was initiated by the Ministry of Agriculture in Rwanda in 2006, and it focuses on uh, the poor households. So it targets poor households uh, receiving a cow uh, so at the beginning, the focus was more on cows, but uh, lately it has transitioned into other uh, livestock species. Now the behavior change intervention uh, uh, element has been called by stakeholders Gabura Amata Mubie, which in English means uh, parents give milk. Next slide, please. So we used uh, a cluster randomized controlled trial design uh, in two districts in Rwanda, Ruhango and Nyabihu districts. Uh, the lowest level, the lowest administrative units were randomized into, uh, into two groups. So one group was a treatment group that received the social behavior change communication intervention. And the other group was a control group that did not receive um, the intervention. We had uh, three treatment, uh, sorry, three uh, study groups. So the first one was a group that uh, had Girinka beneficiaries. So these are the households that benefited from a Girinka cow and uh, also received the social behavior change communication intervention. Then in the control group, we had two study arms. We had a Girinka only study arm. Uh, so these are households with cows, but they didn't receive uh, the the behavior change intervention. And then we had another control group that was eligible to receive a cow. We call them the Girinka eligible. 
uh, they were already in the list so that, uh, you know, when a uh, cow is available, then they would receive. So those were the two control groups. Next. So for the two control groups, the Girinka only and Girinka eligible, we are able to assess the effects of, uh, of having a cow or, or effect of Girinka program on milk consumption and nutritional status of young children. Uh, next. And then the two other uh, Girinka groups, the ones who received uh, the social behavior change intervention and the ones who didn't enables us to assess the effects of uh, the social behavior change intervention on milk consumption, dietary diversity and nutritional status of young children. And for all the three uh, study uh, arms, uh, the eligibility criteria was for the households to have a child uh, aged 12 to 27 months of age. Next, please. The SBCC messages were around six themes. So the first one was around the importance and benefits of cow milk and animal source food consumption in general, uh, targeting pregnant and lactating women as well as young children. Uh, the second one was around the appropriate quantities of consumption of uh, animal source foods and cow milk, but still targeting the pregnant and lactating women and young children. Then the third one was around the appropriate time to introduce animal source foods and cow milk in the diets, particularly of young children. Uh, the fourth one was around identifying uh, symptoms of milk allergy and intolerance and the actions to take. Uh, the fifth one was around hygiene, uh, safe handling and storage of fresh milk. And the last one was around the importance of involving men in maternal and child nutrition. Next slide, please. Right, uh, just go again uh, so that you highlight the key results. Great. So uh, we used a propensity score uh, matching technique to assess the impacts of Girinka program. So basically comparing households that benefited from Girinka and those that were eligible. So these ones were, uh, we used the baseline uh, survey data to do this. So that's before the social behavior change uh, intervention. So the results showed that uh, there's a higher proportion of children from Girinka households who consumed milk in the last uh, one week compared to the non-Girinka uh, uh, beneficiaries. Then uh, go down again. The second one was now around, sorry. Uh, thank you. The other key result was that uh, the Girinka households had less food insecurity just by looking at the food insecurity scores there of uh, uh, minus 1.3. And then the third key result was that the children in Girinka households had better weight for age and height for age Z scores compared to the non-Girinka households. So simply showing that um, uh, having a cow resulted in better child nutritional status. Though this was not optimal, still those uh, uh, figures were pretty low even for the Girinka beneficiaries. So in a nutshell, a Girinka program had a positive effect on child milk consumption, child nutritional status, as well as household food security. Next slide, please. Then now for the uh, social behavior change intervention, the results showed uh, improved maternal knowledge of animal source foods. So many mothers got to know the importance of animal source foods and which ones are actually uh, classified as animal source foods. In addition, there was increased frequency of weekly milk consumption among children in the group that uh, received the social behavior change uh, communication at, uh, at end line. Now, a key result to note is that uh, we didn't observe any differences in dietary diversity or weight for age or height for age discourse between uh, the group that received uh, the SBCC intervention and those that did not receive um, SBCC intervention. And part of the reason for that was because uh, generally uh, there was very low uh, milk production and some of the households also ended up selling a good amount uh, of milk that was uh, produced at home. Uh, so the key lesson from the SBCC intervention is the importance of a multiple throng approach if we want to achieve nutrition outcomes. So 
having the nutrition messages alone, it's not enough, but it should be coupled with other interventions around improving uh, livestock productivity, and in some cases also um, improving women empowerment, particularly in areas around decision making uh, for animal source food consumption at home. Thank you very much. Excellent, thank you so much. That was great. And again, I think it shows that as a communicator that it's not just about, uh, it, it's not just about getting out kind of the, the message, but how you go about doing that and how you empower people and bring together different interventions to really, to, to really change behaviors and attitudes. Excellent. So we'll move to the next presentation. And our final presentation is the effect of livestock ownership, health and nutrition status, uh, low and middle income. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Tedese Zierfo, uh, Zierfu joining us. He is a public health and nutrition specialist uh, with extensive experience in Ethiopia, Kenya, and the UK. Uh, currently, he is the Marie, and I'm going to not pronounce this well, Skodowska uh, Curie Actions Postdoctoral Research Fellow at the Global Academy for, uh, of Agriculture and Food Security at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, he also completed two other postdoctoral fellowships at Tufts University uh, and the African uh, Population and Health Research Center based in uh, Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, he serves as a senior advisor to the Federal Ministry of Health in Ethiopia, among others. So I'd like to hand it over to you, uh, uh, Dr. Tedese, uh, to present your presentation. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and. Uh... Uh, the audience for having this opportunity. So I'm going to present uh, a work in progress, of course, but it is a new completion. It is a systematic review of uh, the effect of livestock ownership on health and nutritional status of women and children, particularly in uh, low and middle income uh, settings. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, I, as you have seen, uh, livestock ownership or livestock uh, or, uh, tribe food are rich in many nutrients, and uh, the benefits have been well discussed by Laura and my colleagues before. But uh, there are also studies showing uh, contradicting impacts of livestock, especially negative impacts uh, on health of children and, and women, as well as nutritional status, uh, mainly through contamination uh, and exposure to microbes. Uh, nevertheless, uh, there is no, uh, there was not any evidence or synthesized evidence elucidating the real effect of this or the association between livestock ownership and livestock uh, outcomes, nutritional and health outcomes. So, uh, a, a team of uh, global researchers from uh, Kenya, from Africa, from UK, and uh, the US also conducted a systematic review, uh, searched about 24 scientific databases available worldwide using keywords. Uh, two reviewers screened all the titles and abstracts of uh, that uh, papers identified through the, this uh, search and uh, two also reviewed the full text. And finally, uh, one data extractor of extracts the data and checked by another. Next slide, please. So when you see the, the total number of uh, papers identified, we identified initially about 51,000 references. And finally, after uh, excluding uh, because of various reasons, we ended up with about 178 papers which are finally synthesized and coming with a result. Next slide, please. So when you see the results, uh, Unlike the benefits, there have been also several adverse health effects of livestock ownership, as I've said in the background, through contamination. Uh, and some of uh, the reported adverse health outcomes or diseases which are transmitted from livestock to humans include uh, acute gastrointestinal uh, illnesses, uh, brucellosis, asthma, and several others which have been mentioned here. And also there are others uh, which are left for, uh, for, the, for the interest of time showing that uh, unless uh, careful attention is given or the, the uh, ownership of livestock should not be granted for its benefit only. It has, uh, it has shown that there are some adverse health effects or diseases which are transmitted from livestock to humans, particularly affecting those vulnerable population groups, children and women. Next slide, please. 
On the other hand, as many have also reported, the nutritional outcomes are very much uh, promising, showing that ownership of livestock in many of those studies which we have analyzed, uh, improving or, uh, or have a positive association with uh, uh, child stunting, that means having on uh, or owning a livestock, reducing stunting and wasting, as well as uh, the anthropometric indices of uh, uh, the indicators of uh, acute and chronic uh, nutritional status. Some studies have also shown uh, that ownership can even uh, aggravate wasting and sometimes uh, stunting, where of course the evidence is uh, limited, but most of the studies uh, showing that uh, ownership of livestock is positively or can enhance nutritional status of both women and children. Nevertheless, its effect on health uh, it should be considered uh, carefully. So this is uh, just briefly the work, the, the result of the work in progress. Uh, I thank you for attending. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tedesse. And again, we, we can go a little bit more in depth uh, during the discussion session. We're a little bit late, but I'd like to I'd like to propose that we go over a little bit, uh, about 10 minutes. And I'd like to invite uh, Di Harvey, uh, who is the uh, who is the lead technical specialist uh, for uh, Venture 37. Uh, technical director for Venture 37. And I'd like to ask him and everybody, all the other panelists uh, to turn on their camera and we will spotlight them. And we're gonna have a quick uh, discussion. If you have questions, put them into the chat uh, and we'll raise them to, uh, to Di Harvey and he'll ask the panelists. So if everyone can turn on their camera uh, from the panelist side, we'll spotlight you and uh, hand it over to you, uh, Di. Thank you very much. Um, we already have a few questions um, in the chat, so thank you for that, and please put a few more in here. Um, so the very uh, first question that we have, um, please, is uh, for Laura, if she'd be able to answer this one, is are there studies in developing countries that demonstrate um, LDF is cheaper and easily accessible than plant-based diets, especially those who argue, uh, especially uh, to argue with the vegetarian aficionados. Um, would you maybe like to have a crack at that one? And if there's anyone else to support? Sure, I think, um, you know, that there has been evidence showing that LDFs, animal source foods, are um, what we might consider luxury foods. Um, and they are out of the reach of many populations, unfortunately. However, I think within the category of animal source foods, there are certain products that are more accessible and affordable, um, such as eggs and milk. And that's one of the reasons why our research has focused on those particular products from animal source foods. Um, I, I think it's a very good question about um, vegetarianism. And I encourage the attendees to this webinar to look at the literature. They, they are increasingly showing that veganism especially can have harmful effects um, on health, uh, especially in children, pregnant women, and lactating women. So that, you know, vegetarianism is different. You still have ed uh, eggs and milk um, and other animal products in your diet. Um, pescatarianism, for example, with fish. Um, but there can be harmful effects if there are no animal source foods at all in the diet. We, we won't get any vitamin B12 in that respect. Over. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that. That's, uh, that's, that's excellent. That's excellent. Um, the next question, I think, would be uh, directed um, for Balakana. Um, which is saying that DNA um, is an ambitious program addressing malnutrition in Africa and would appeal, and we would appeal if there are opportunities for other East African countries such as Ethiopia to join the program. Um, could you answer what, what is the ambition for, for DNA? And then we'll quickly move on. Thank you, Dai. Okay, thank you. Actually, uh, there is a, an ambitious, it's true, but uh, we are working uh, to make sure that at least uh, this ambition is uh, uh, really addressed from the beginning, where we we, we implement uh, this uh, uh, promotion campaign 
or putting sustainability in, in, in the forefront where we look on those options where uh, the, the parents uh, will be the ones who will be uh, educated and who will be uh, uh, trying to ensure that they feed their children for sustainability purposes. So I think it's something which uh, once we implement and the, we have all the data on the, on the, on the, on the ground, we're able to share with the other countries in East Africa to really uh, maybe adopt some of the good things that we will be achieving in this program. Over to you. Great, thank you very much. Um, very helpful, very helpful. Um, uh, one here, I think, uh, very much for for maybe Emily, if you could have a have a think about this one. So, most uh, poor rural people eat chicken and eggs because they're relatively plentiful and cheap. They eat less of mutton, goats, and beef because these are more expensive. Seems that the decisive factor is availability and affordability. Um, nutrition, nutritionists add health and nutrition parameters to the formula. It'd be interesting to see some research on consumption behavior of the poor when nutritional aspects are considered. Would you like to make a comment um, on that? Yeah, I think uh, I agree because um, for some of the species like uh, poultry, it's easier for poor people to access eggs and allocate eggs uh, for household consumption compared to, um, to other larger species like even pigs or, or, or sheep because those ones are possibly targeted for the market. It's rare that they would uh, slaughter uh, specifically for home consumption. Then on the other hand, for those who purchase, um, yeah, in some cases, uh, it's a bit way off for poor consumers. It's a bit more expensive. Thanks. So it means we need, we need interventions that could actually um, try to ensure, you know, even the poor people can access them, you know, so make them more affordable for the poor. Excellent, thank you for that. I'm getting at a quick question for you, knowing your wonderful experience in feed. Do you think smallholder farmers can improve dairy breeds um, without, uh, without a problem as livestock feed is becoming a serious issue? I think this is an issue all over Eastern, uh, Eastern Africa. Um, and this, uh, so is it, is it possible to, to improve the productivity of our, of our livestock and the genetic potential of the livestock without improving the, the feed? Yeah. Thank you. The, uh, <clears throat> actually, improving the, the local breeds might not be as simple as, you know, as we might think, because uh, it's not only the breed that's, that's very important. There are a lot of things that should go parallel, like, for example, improvement in feed availability, you know, uh, especially quality feed availability, so that we, we can get the expected outputs from the improved breed. Uh, it might take time. For example, uh, if you take under Ethiopian condition, uh, you know, uh, previously it was very difficult to have uh, crossbred uh, animals. But nowadays, because farmers understand the advantages and benefits and the stressing conditions of, you know, scarcity of land, uh, feed shortage, and so on, and, you know, uh, understanding the market oriented uh, dairy farming. Now farmers are understand that improving the, the, the cattle breeds they have improve the feed availability and efficiently utilize what they have might be you know the approach and of course uh, the trend is changing but I, I feel you know it might take time it's not as easy as we might think because cattle especially has a diverse uses in Ethiopia it is used for traction and so on so it, it's it might be very slow but time is coming, you know, the need for improving uh, the, the local animals. Excellent, thank you very much. That's very, very helpful. I'm going to, uh, in the sense of time, I'm just going to um, do one more, one more question. And, and that, this is for Laura, which I think will be nicely just to wrap up, which is Laura, could you say more about limiting nutrients and how animal source foods are differentiated um, with that regard? Um, if you could mention, just speak a little bit um, to, to that for the, for the whole group. Sure, thank you for that question. Um, when I say limiting nutrients, I mean 
nutrients that are deficient or where there are gaps in the diet. Um, and that means that they're limiting in that children can't grow to their full potential or develop their brain to the full potential because that nutrient is absent in their diet. So animal source foods provide some of those nutrients that we often see deficient in populations like vitamin A, B12, iron, and zinc, and they're highly bioavailable. I saw another question about isometabolic differences. Um, that's what I was trying to communicate is that in an animal source food matrix, the compound of those nutrients is more easily absorbed. And that's why they're very important to have as part of the diet, of course, in moderation and in variety. We want to keep emphasizing the importance of diet diversity, um, but the presence of, of animal source foods is, is essential in, in certain parts of the life course. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for all of the other questions. Um, we will um, address these. We will not be able to address them now as we're out of time, but we'll address these and get these back to you as a, as a wider group. This has been a fantastic um, discussion and thank you very much. I would like to um, take my great thanks to the panelists who I think have done a, a magnificent job and have given us wonderful, uh, wonderful insights into the different aspects of work, not only from the research side, but also the implementation. How does this happen and how do we get this to work on the ground um, as this rolls out? And I think, uh, as, as always, the, the, the single biggest challenge is behavioral change and, and really getting that understanding of how can we change our behavior. And I think also the take home message for me certainly is um, the, there are certain areas in the world that are, that are in challenges and we're gonna, we'll, we'll speak a little bit about, about that in a minute. I'm going to now hand over uh, back to, to Michael um, for, for wrapping up. So thank you very much to the panelists. Um, and thank you very much to the participants for all of your questions. Very, very good. Excellent. Yeah, thank you, Di, and thank you all the panelists for the great presentation and some really good discussion here. I'd just like to hand it over to uh, Isabel Baltenweck, who is the program leader for policy institutions and livelihoods at ILRI, and she'll be giving us a quick summary and some of the key highlights from her own perspective. So over to you, Isabel. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, everybody, for that uh... It's insightful um, webinar. Every time I listen to Laura, I learn something new when I listen to her as well, <laughs> all the content today. So thanks, thanks everybody for, for, for those. I would like just to summarize today's webinar with, uh, with three L, Ls. I mean, really it's about, you know, how, how important life stock is it for livelihoods. And, you know, Laura and all the presentations have shown really about this important, not only for, for protein, but also nutrient. B twelve was mentioned several times. I hope that's your you take home message. You know uh, how important uh, livestock derived food, foods are, are really important for for, uh, for nutrition and health. And even though uh, you know we, we still look at the evidence, I think there's uh, there's lots of uh, of positive effects of of that. The, the second L I wanted I wanted to mention is about leveraging leveraging uh, livestock productivity uh, interventions, productivity enhancing technologies, not only to look at stopping at the animal, but really about how do we complement those, uh, those projects, those interventions, those activities with nutrition sensitive interventions like the SBCC work, which has been mentioned several times as well today. So that we don't only stop at, let's say, increasing meal production or increasing income, but really moving beyond that and looking at how livestock can support uh, nutrition. So that's my second L. And my and my last L is really about learning. I think we really have to be better in terms uh, in for both researcher and development partners, policymakers, on how we collaborate. And uh, and this learning is really about how much how more can we learn better in terms of uh, embedding research in development activities. So my research in development work, so that we can get better data, understand as well what what species what interventions work better and speed up how whole livestock can, uh, can support uh, human nutrition and health. So that has been, uh, for me, quite an insightful discussion. And um, for the sake of time as well, let me stop here. Thanks, everybody, for, for the great work. And uh, I hope we all learn uh, today something today. Thanks. 
Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, I really like those three L's, uh, Isabel. That's great. Uh, we have a question from Peter, which really helps us to end this. Yes, there will be additional webinars. This was the first one in this Livestock and Livelihoods uh, webinar series. The next one we're planning to have on One Health, and I think we'll have it uh, after uh, after kind of vacation break uh, that many people will be taking in July and August, uh, and probably sometime in September. So, you know, watch this station, as they say. And again, I'd like to thank particularly all the speakers and panelists who put this together, as well as the team behind everything. And we had a lot of people who really supported this, uh, particularly uh, Madeline Baltus uh, and Sa Sa uh, Hina Saeed from, uh, from Venture 37. And we had Susan McMillan and Murray, uh, particularly and Annabelle Slater and Murray Ferreri from uh, ILRI, who really supported putting this together. So. Uh, we'll be learning some lessons. We'll have a survey that we'll send out to participants to get some uh, ways that we can improve this webinar series and hope to see you at the next one as well. And there should be a recording and a, a blog of this uh, that will come out in the coming weeks. So thank you very much.